we will be continuing our series on the book of Joshua. This Lord's Day will be the third message on the uh, introduction or foundation, if you will, to some of the things that we'll be looking at as we go through the book. I'm expecting to do at least two more Sundays of introductory material to get us well acquainted with the book as a whole, some particulars within that book, which will enable us to just jump in and appreciate everything that God is teaching us in that book. Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for the fact that we can experience your grace and mercy, that we can know that we are going to hear your word to the extent that it is spoken truly. So, Lord, give your people a message in spite of your messenger. Open our minds and our hearts to what you have for us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Our key verse for the book of Joshua was out of the 21st chapter, verses 43 to 45, which I will read. So the Lord gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they possessed it and lived in it. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And no one of all their enemies stood before them. The Lord gave all their enemies into their hand. Not one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. And then we also used Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How these two verses tie together is because of the war-rest dynamic that we're going to talk about, which we summarized in our theme, which we will repeat as well. The idea behind all of this foundational material is to get us acquainted with some of the most important things that I think God is trying to teach us out of the book of Joshua. As you know, as I said last week and the week before, that the book of Joshua is history. It is historical narrative. But more than that, God uses history and historical narrative as such to dress up the propositional truth that he's trying to teach us. And just by way of remembrance, for me to say that God is all-powerful might mean something to you. But now if we read the story of the parting of the Red Sea, all of a sudden God's power comes to life in ways that simply stating the propositional truth, God is all-powerful, would not necessarily convey. So the book of Joshua contains most, if not all, of the important doctrines that we hold to as Orthodox, Protestant, Reformed Christians. That is to say, we see God's justice. The book of Joshua primarily is a book of God's justice. We see his mercy. As I said, we see his mercy in the whole episode with Rahab. We see how God has condescended to man to meet man where he is to effectuate his will in obeying God. And this is one of the things that I want to just briefly look at this morning, even before we get into today's message. The verse says, So the Lord gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to give their fathers. The Lord gave Israel all the land. As we said in terms of sanctification, it is synergistic. And the whole book of Joshua is about how God has come alongside the nation of Israel and Joshua in particular to carry out and to do his will. Joshua is the executor of his will. If you've ever been an executor of anybody's will, you know what your responsibilities are. God's will was to punish the Amorites, as we noted last time in Genesis chapter 15, God told Abraham, your descendants are going into Egypt for 400 years. They're going to be slaves, but when they come out, they're going to come right back to this very spot and execute my justice on the Amorites for their iniquity is not yet full. And that took six to 800 years for that to take place. God is not slow about keeping his promises. We needn't 
be like most who are out there saying, well, all things, as is stated in Peter, all things are going on just as they always were. Where is God? He is not acting. It took 600 years for him to fulfill that promise to Abraham about the nation of Israel coming back out of Egypt to execute his justice. And Joshua and the second generation that came out of Egypt is his tool. We get in God comes alongside of us in ways that we can't explain to obey. We're given that resurrection power to obey. The book of Philippians, the third chapter, Paul prays that we experience the resurrection power. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. The resurrection power is the power that God has given us we can tap into You see, to obey. We're always given power to obey. And we need to understand that. I may not be given power to raise the dead. I may not be given power to effect this miracle or that miracle. The power that God gives us is to obey because it is an accompaniment to us wanting to do His will and carry out His will. So God's will for Joshua and the rest of the nation of Israel was to execute His justice on the Amorites and to give that land to the nation of Israel. So we read, the Lord gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers. Now hold that thought as I read this. Out of Joshua 10, you don't have to turn there. Then Joshua and all Israel with him passed on from Makeda to Libna and fought against Libna. And the Lord gave it also with its king into the hands of Israel, and he struck it and every person who was with it with the edge of the sword. He left no survivor in it. Thus he did to the king, just as he had done to the king of Jericho. And Joshua and all Israel with him passed on from Libna to Lachish, and they camped by it and fought against it. And the Lord gave Lachish into the hands of Israel, and he captured it on the second day and struck it and every person who was in it with the edge of the sword, according to all that he had done to Libna. Then Haram, king of Gezer, came up to help Lachish, and Joshua defeated him and his people until he had left him no survivor. And Joshua and all Israel with him passed on from Lachish to Eglon, and they camped by it and fought against it, and they captured it on that day and struck it with the edge of the sword. And he utterly destroyed that day every person who was in it, according to all that he had done to Lachish. And it goes on and on and on, and you get the idea. Actually, that happened to 31 kings in all. At the end of chapter 12, we're told how many kings and cities and peoples Joshua and the nation of Israel utterly destroyed by the sword. Yet we read, the Lord gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers. I hardly think that they just marched in and took the land as a gift. Oh, it was a gift. But uh, Joshua and the nation of Israel had a fight for the land. The Lord gave Israel all the land. Every single city, 31 kings, were utterly destroyed. Now, I want you to understand something. This God that we just heard about in the larger catechism class, who is independent, self-sufficient, does not need us, has condescended to come alongside of us and empower us for obedience to his will. That's the other theme that we touched on last time that we spoke, and that was the fact that God comes alongside. Sanctification is synergistic, and he empowers us to effect his will, that is to obey. Now think about this. God gave Israel all the land. It wasn't without a fight. It wasn't without 31 fights. And the fights were bloody. I want you to understand what this means. Joshua, as the leader of the nation of Israel, had to go into these cities. He had to physically wield his sword. He's the one that had to chop off heads as an encouragement to all the army behind him to chop off heads. He's the one that had to take this sword and drive it through the heart of a two-year-old and all the other children. He's the one that had to take the spear and run through the pregnant women. This was not pretty. The land was just not given to them. They had to fight for it. Yet we read, the Lord gave Israel all the land. As a matter of fact, in chapter 11, And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel so that they defeated them and pursued them as far as Sidon and Mizrioth, Ma'am, and the Valley of Mizpah. The Lord delivered them. This was the plan to execute justice in the most brutal and bloody way. Israel had to fight for the land. So too we have to fight 
for our land, that is to say, in the process of our sanctification. There is no excuse. We are saved and delivered from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin. If you're sitting here blood-bought, born again, you're delivered from the penalty of sin. That is to say, heaven is your inheritance. You have been delivered from the kingdom of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Delivered from the penalty of sin. You are delivered from, will be delivered from the very presence of sin in glory. And you won't have any option. You won't have any choice to sin. Because you see, what we consider and call the old sin nature, which is just the remnants of the old sinful self, will be totally eradicated and we will be delivered from the presence of sin. But right here and right now is where the problem is. We are delivered from the power of sin if we choose to obey. Be strong and courageous, God tells Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Take the land. I will fight for you. I will fight with you. I will go before you. It is the Lord gave Israel all the land. Oh, they had to go into the battlefield and they had to wield the swords and they had to throw the spears and they had to hamstring all the horses and they had to bring all the carcasses and burn them, and they had to do all that was required. They had to do everything that was required on their part. They walked in faith. Because I have news for you, this was a ragtag bunch of sheep, sheep herders. They were not military strategists. Joshua was not a military strategist, although some say that what he did was brilliant in terms of taking the land. Most of these guys probably didn't know what end of the spear to hold. And yet, they were absolutely, utterly defeated, defeated all of God's enemies because they were strong, courageous, went in the land, and obeyed. They were strong, courageous, went into the land, and obeyed. And God did what God said he was going to do. There's a lesson here for us, and we're going to see that throughout the book of Joshua when we finally get into it, that God is not slack concerning his promises in terms of delivering us and giving us the victory that we so sorely need. We walk around defeated. We walk around with long faces, and once in a while, someone may get us to say, oh, praise the Lord, full well knowing we are living defeated before our enemies. I want to know where the strength is, where the courage is. Where there is no strength and no courage to go in and defeat our enemies, those besetting sins, because we suffer from an unbelievable lack of faith in what God can do. We sit and we talk about it. We talk Christianese. We say, praise the Lord. Jesus can do it. Jesus is good. He can deliver me. But we don't experience it. The promise is that God will come alongside of you and defeat your enemies, whatever those besetting sins are. And I know everybody has them. This past week, we, I did an awful lot of counseling with guys who, in prison, many men are addicted to pornography. You say, well, how does that happen? Well, we don't have time to get into that now. And so we're starting a course called The Way of Purity, which is Bible-based way to defeat the enemy of lust. And the first thing is, is that you have to be willing to get rid of everything that can induce you to do that. Now, in prison, they don't have access to computers, but here's an idea. If you're fighting that problem, and you are supposed to do like Joshua did, be strong and courageous and do everything that you can do to defeat your enemy, my suggestion to you is get rid of your computer. Oh, no, I can't do that. I do too much on the computer. I got business. I got this. I got that. I got the other thing. Well, then you answer to God for the fact that you haven't done everything you can do to defeat this enemy. You see, we're personally responsible for this. We have to be willing to be strong, courageous, and trust God, but do everything that we can do. And then we will experience that victory. Romans 8, if you do mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall become alive to God. I've stood in this pulpit and said that probably 50 times. 
If you do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall become alive to God in a way that you have never experienced before. But mortification is self-crucifixion. Mortification is self-denial. Mortification is saying no to you. And if that's what it takes, as it does, because the Bible tells us, then one needs to be committed to do it. So the Lord gave Israel all the land, but Israel had to do their part. So by way of remembrance, some of the things that we talked about, remember, in terms of the mercy that was shown in the midst of justice, we talked about the harlot Rahab, who became the great-grandmother of David. God is merciful. There's propositional truth in the person of Rahab. We talked about the fact that it is not that God is so bloodthirsty, but that he is executing his justice on sin, and it was time for the Amorites. I also said that the approach to this book was going to be just a little bit different than what you may be used to. The theme for this book, which I want to repeat every message so we get it, is this. The victory over our enemy and the blessing of the realization of the Sabbath rest promised to God's people as typified in this war rest dynamic in the book of Joshua is entered into only by a true faith demonstrated by an active obedience to God's holy law. You choose to obey, you choose to trust him for him to do his part in your life, come alongside of you just like he came alongside of Joshua and the rest of the nation of Israel to defeat their enemies. An active obedience to God's holy law. You see, we, we have a problem saying, I don't experience God. You know, God is some doctrinal, ethereal mystery thing out there that I really don't experience. We write about him, we preach about him, we talk about him, we say this and that, but we don't experience God himself. The reason we don't experience God himself is because I am not committed to obey. I guarantee you, commit to obey. God and trust him for the strength you'll experience God in a way that you haven't before he has promised if you want to see the will of God in your life and experience that then start praying the promises of God the promises of God are God's will in your life I guarantee you those are prayers that he will answer but you have to commit to do what is required on your part. And it is always going to be a part of sacrifice. It's always going to be sacrificial on your part. I hear this all the time. Well, the Holy Spirit led me to do this. The Holy Spirit led me to do that. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. I have news for you. As I read my Bible, the Holy Spirit only leads you to a place of death so that you can experience the life of God in a greater fashion. I don't want to debate whether or not you think the Holy Spirit is leading you to buy a new Mercedes-Benz. I don't know about that. But I do know that the Holy Spirit will lead you into a more sanctified, holy life if you choose to obey. And that is the point, is it not? God's plan for us is our sanctification. To be to the praise of the glory of His grace we have heard about in these past couple weeks from the messages from Dr. Talbot. To the praise of the glory of his grace, we are predestined to holiness. So the victory over our enemy and the blessing of that realization promised to God's people as typified in the war rest dynamic in the book of Joshua is entered into only by a true faith demonstrated by an act of obedience to God's holy law. And let me remind you, when we're talking about this, don't confuse this. I am not in the least bit saying that we have to work to be saved. We work because we're saved. And I'm going to tell you something. The work and effort that you put into your sanctification is simply an evidence of your re regeneration. It is an evidence of the Spirit of God working in you. Why? Because we are given faith and repentance at the time that we are justified. We are given 
faith to turn towards Jesus Christ, to embrace Him and Him alone in payment for our sin. We are given the gift of repentance towards God, as Paul says in Acts chapter 27. Faith and repentance, two sides of the same coin. So a willingness to obey should be the most obvious fruit in the life of a Christian. Now we're not called to go to physical battle and chop anybody's heads off. But I am called to go into spiritual battle, for it is not against flesh and blood that we wage this war, but against principalities and powers in high places. And what are we called to do? There, in the book of Ephesians, we are called to put on the whole armor of God. It's not a physical sword, but it is the sword of the word. It's the only offensive weapon. We are told to gird ourselves with a breastplate of right, our helmet of righteousness. We are to gird our loins with truth, shot our feet with the gospel of peace. So we are to put on the full armor of God, and then after we do that, what are we told to do? Stand. I don't have to go looking for dragons to slay. They will find me, but I need to be prepared. I need to be prepared to go into that battle against that dragon, against that sin, against the temptation. And they come in all forms, shapes, and sizes. Faith and repentance. A true faith, demonstrated by an act of obedience to God's holy law. Let's not forget, by their fruits you shall know them. I deal with this all the time. Oh, chaplain, I'm saved, I'm saved. I accepted the Lord 10 years ago. Well, you know, as far as I see, you're living like a pig. There's no evidence of fruit there. No repentance. No repentance. No faith. See, the repentant part is a whole lot easier to see than the faith part. Because somebody can say they've got faith, but the way we believe, faith and repentance are gifts given at the same time. You don't get one without the other. So if you're telling me that you have saving faith, I'm going to look at your life, and I'm going to see the battle that you're engaged in. I'm not looking for a perfect life, but I want to see the battle. And there are some men that come to my office in tears saying, Chaplain, I can't get over this. I just don't understand what to do. I can't get over this sin. I say, praise the Lord. And they're sitting there in tears because they can't get over this sin. Evidence of God working in their life. Evidence of the Spirit of God producing fruit of sanctification, a desire to be holy. See, faith and repentance. You don't have to be a theologian to look at somebody's life and know what God they're serving. It's real simple. Faith and repentance, no saving faith unless we see evidence of a repentant lifestyle. This rest of God promised to the people of God is appropriated by the grace of God, acting through faith, through faith, and proved by the obedience of the child of God. Well, that's by way of summary of what we've covered in Reminder. We also said that this rest was elusive for Israel. The physical rest was elusive. Why? Because in the first 12 chapters they conquered the land, in the last 12 chapters they divided it up. The problem was, and the sad part of the book of Joshua is, that all the vic victories that they got in the first 12 chapters, they gave up territory in the last 12 chapters, because those remnants of those cities and the kings that they did not conquer, they chose to live side by side with. And they compromised. And compromised brought idolatry. And idolatry in the land of Canaan always brought perversity. And they were right back doing the same things that the Canaanites were doing that they were told to go in and destroy. The rest that Israel so sought after was, in fact, typical. It was typical. It wasn't just a prefigurement, not just by analogy, not by points of coincidence. The rest that was foretold was that of the great eternal reward and inheritance promised by God to all his children. So as you're reading through the book of Joshua, and there's references to the rest, and God gave them rest, and God gave them rest, it was typical. It was typical of the final great eternal reward inheritance, that Sabbath rest that all true saints of God will someday 
enjoy. Now I said <clears throat> that this rest spoken of in the book of Joshua is typical because it meets the definition for typical. You know, something to be a legitimate type in the Old Testament, it has to be explained as such in the New Testament. Well, this rest is given 30 verses of explanation in the book of Hebrews. And I want to remind you that the book of Hebrews is the book which explains Old Testament types. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 5 to 4, 16, which we'll be covering today at least in part points to the fact that this rest is speaking of the eternal rest and something that we all, if you are a child of God, will someday participate in. But just like so many other things, eschatologically, it is already but not yet. We do have that peace that passes all understanding from time to time. But that peace that passes all understanding is crowded out by cares and concerns and temptations and sin and confusion and failure because we're still in the flesh, but someday that will be gone. In contrast, we said that Joshua is only mentioned two times, two verses, Acts 7.45, having received it in their turn, our fathers brought it with Joshua, talking about the ark, dispossessing the nations whom God drove out before our fathers until the time of David. And in Hebrews 4.8, for if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. The only two verses that speaks of Joshua himself, the rest, 30 verses talk of the rest that Joshua tried to secure for the nation of Israel. So that's the reason why this is so important. So we're going to start in the book of Hebrews today, chapter 3, verse 5, to chapter 4, verse 16. And we're going to take the time to read it all. I want you to be thinking of some of the these points as we go through this, you're going to see what I mean. And hopefully, this will help bring the book of Joshua alive to you as you are reading through it in the next couple of weeks. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 5 to 4, 16. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for forty years. Therefore I was angry with this generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brethren, lest there should be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ. If we hold fast, the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear they should not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? And so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Therefore, let us fear, lest while a promise remains of entering his rest, any of you should seem to have come short of it. For indeed we have had good news preached to us, just as they also but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest. Just as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has said thus, somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest, 
Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience. He again fixes a certain day today, saying through David after so long a time, just as he has said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. There remains therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall through following the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. Have mercy. What a passage of Scripture. This particular passage is so pregnant theologically, it's difficult to know where to begin. Hopefully you got some of the flavor of this, though. Some of the idea behind the whole book of Joshua is indicated here. That whole first generation didn't make it into the promised land because of their disobedience. How did they disobey? They were steeped in unbelief. And we're going to see, the, the, the writer here quotes Psalm 95. We're going to talk a little bit about that. They were disobedient. They did not enter his rest because they were disobedient because of unbelief. Do you understand? Belief corresponds to obedience. Obedience corresponds to God coming alongside synergistically and giving the rest. Unbelief, on the other hand, corresponds to disobedience. So we had the whole first generation did not make it into the promised land because of unbelief. They all fell in the wilderness. It was the second generation that went in to the promised land. Something we need to touch on at the beginning of this. Now Moses was faithful in all his house. Verse 6, but Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are. If we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Notice he says Christ was faithful over his house, whose house we are. Whose house we are. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is the epistle of Peter, chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God, whose house we are. You see, if you're sitting here saved, you have the Spirit of God living within you. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. God dwells within His people. There is not to be some sort of new temple instituted, built in the Holy Land, where sacrifices are going to be reinstituted again. Here is another thing that we need to deal with in terms of this book. You see, much of this, much of the nation of Israel, in terms of their history, rightly dividing the word of truth, we understand, we come to know that God is going to dwell among his people. There will not be a need for a physical temple. Even in Revelation, we're told that God is going to dwell among his people. God dwells among the praise of his people. And in his presence is fullness of joy. So if you want to experience God, then my suggestion to you is whatever your circumstances are, praise him, because there he is. Whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence 
and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Here's the first of three holding fast our confidence. The first of three. Holding fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Notice we're supposed to hold fast our confidence, our hope. What is our hope? That blessed hope. Among other things, that hope that we look to to give us encouragement as we go through day by day is in the final analysis, the resurrection. If we hold fast our confidence in the boast of our hope firm until the end. This is about perseverance. Of course, he's talking about firm until the end because the nation of Israel didn't hold fast firm until the end. They did well in the first 12 chapters and then blew it the last 12. They did not hold fast firm until the end, therefore never experienced that rest of God. We are to hold firm until the end. It's about perseverance. It's about perseverance. It's about perseverance. Jesus said, the one who perseveres to the end, what? Shall be saved. Not because the perseverance is saving him. It's because the perseverance is an indication of a repentance lifestyle which keeps the child of God in the arena doing battle against sin. Perseverance is an indication of the commitment to repentance. See, this is all very practical. And there's nothing complicated about it. But we like to get off track and make things harder than they are by shrouding them in theological terms, saying, I just can't understand it. Well, we can't understand it. If we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end... Verse 7, therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says. Just as the Holy Spirit says. Well, if you have any questions in terms of the inspiration of your Bible, you can question anything and everything, but not Psalm 95. Because the writer to the Hebrews here says, just as the Holy Spirit says. Today, if you hear his voice. We need to turn to Psalm 95. You don't have to. I will. I'll read the whole thing for you. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Verse 7, today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the days of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they had seen my work for 40 years. I loathed that generation. And said, they are a people who err in their heart, and they do not know my ways. Therefore I swore in my anger, truly they shall not enter into my rest. We are told, the Holy Spirit here is saying that God loathed that generation for their disobedience, which was symptomatic of their unbelief. What is he referring to here? Harden your hearts as at Meribah, as at the days of Massa. He's referring to Exodus chapter 17 and Numbers chapter 20. And let me give you a brief synopsis. Exodus chapter 17 verses 1 to 7 was the first time approximately three to six months after Israel left Egypt into the wilderness, having passed through the Red Sea. Now, they just passed through the Red Sea. They saw this miracle, right? Three to six months, there in abouts in that time frame, they were complaining about not having any water. Exodus 17, 1 to 7, all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin according to the command of the Lord. According to the command of the Lord. The command of the Lord led them to a place where there was no water. See, the Holy Spirit may be leading you to buy a new Mercedes-Benz. I do know this. If he leads you to a place of sacrifice, if he leads you to a place of testing, like he led Jesus into the wilderness, that you can be sure of. Commanded the Lord and camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses, said, Give us water that we may drink. Moses said, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? The people thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So here it is. They just experienced the deliverance. 
The greatest deliverance the world has ever seen is evidenced by the fact when the Bible talks about the power of God, it always refers to the parting of the Red Sea and the deliverance of the nation of Israel from the Egyptians. They just experienced it. God has led them. Pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. The Holy Spirit is leading them and He has led them to a place where they have no water. God isn't always going to lead you to a place of convenience. He's not going to lead you to a place of happiness. He's not going to lead you to a place where things are just so comfortable for you. He's going to lead you to a place of testing to see whether or not you will trust Him or not. So Israel blew it. The people thirsted there for water and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children? Moses cried out to the Lord saying, What shall I do to this people? A little more they will stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb. You shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he named the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel and because they tested the Lord saying, Is the Lord among us or not? That's what Psalm 95 is. And the writer to the Hebrews quoted Psalm 95 as the epitome of their unfaithfulness. God led them to this place, and it was not convenient, and it was not comfortable. And they quarreled with the Lord, tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Because things were not so convenient for them. That was at the beginning of their journey in the wilderness, Exodus 17. The other event was in Numbers chapter 20, exact same circumstances. But now this was at the end of the 40 years. At the beginning of the 40 years, they were tested with water. And at the end of the 40 years, they were tested in exactly the same way. But there's a significant difference in this one. And remember, we went over this, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul says the rock that followed them was Christ. They received living waters from the rock that was struck. You see, the rock was Christ. That was at the beginning. At the end of the 40 years, Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 to 13. The sons of Israel, the whole congregation, came to the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed at Kadesh. Now Miriam died there and was buried there. Aaron also shortly died thereafter, which is how we know that it was at the end of the 40 years. And there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves against Moses and Aaron. The people thus contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought us out here? Why have you brought the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our beasts to die here? Why have you made us come up from Egypt to bring us into this wretched place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates. Remember, that's what they had as a promise. Nor is there water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron came in from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting and fell on their face, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now listen, take the rod. You and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation and speak to the rock. The first time he was told to strike the rock. This time he was told to speak to the rock. That it may yield its water. You shall thus bring forth water for them out of the rock and let the congregation and their beasts drink. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord just as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock and he said to them, Listen now, you rebels. Shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and he struck the rock twice. And water came forth abundantly and the congregation and their beasts drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you have not believed me, to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Those were the waters of Meribah because the sons of Israel contended with the Lord and he proved himself holy among them. God told Moses to speak to the rock and he struck the rock 
twice. And because of that, Moses was not allowed into the promised land. Why? Because this disobedience said to the nation of Israel that Moses does not hold the Lord holy because of his disobedience. Now, what else? Why was that even significant to begin with? We know that Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin. Hebrews 9, 28. Hebrews 10, 10 to 14. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. The rock was supposed to be struck once. The good shepherd, the great shepherd of the sheep, will be smitten one time. And that happened in the beginning of their journey. He was supposed to speak to the rock the second time, and he struck it again. The good shepherd is not to be struck a second time, or a third time, or a fourth time. As we read, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. No, one sacrifice for all time, the great shepherd of the sheep will be struck down. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. I want you to think about this for just a second. In 40 years' time, thousands and thousands of lambs, calves, bulls were slaughtered. Now think about this. Every morning and every evening, there had to be a lamb offered, a blood sacrifice, and then burnt on the altar of burnt offering. 70 people went into, went into Egypt. Two million came out. So there's two million people that have the responsibility and obligation to be offering sin offerings and burnt offerings and peace offerings in compliance with the various offerings that God had told Moses to require of the people. How much blood was flowing from that altar of burnt offering? If I was a member of the nation of Israel at the time, I would bring my lamb because I have sinned. And there would probably be a lineup behind me. I would bring my lamb or my calf, depending on how rich or poor I was. I would offer it to the priest. Before it was sacrificed, I would lay my hands on the head of that lamb to transfer my guilt to that lamb that was to be slain. Then the priest would give me the machete, would give me the knife, and I would cut the throat of the lamb. I would kill the lamb. And the priest would hold there, stand there with a gold goblet or chalice and catch the blood as it spurted out of his neck. And then he would take that blood and throw it at the base of the altar upon which the lamb would finally be burned. So this is repeated thousands and thousands and thousands of times all day long. Blood is being poured at the base of that altar. There was probably a river of blood that went through the camp of Israel. You couldn't get away from the blood. All of the blood of the bulls and goats could not take away sin. But the sacrifice of the perfect Lamb of God, to which that looked to, took away the sins of his people. I love that hymn. There is a fountain filled with blood that flows from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunged beneath the flood lose all their guilt and shame. Hallelujah. Well, my time is up. So we'll have to pick up from there. Next time we're not going to backtrack. We're going to just pick up where we left off. So hopefully... If you need some refreshment, you'll be, you'll go online or get the DVD or catch up and read. But we are now just getting into the significance of this rest and what it means for you and me as the people of God.